If you're learning about research skills and methodologies, you may have heard the term research onion. Specifically, the research onion developed by Saunders et al. in 2007 is being commonly used to teach research students. But what exactly is this elusive onion? In this post, we'll break the research onion down into bite-sized chunks to make it a little, little more digestible. At the simplest level, Saunders' research onion describes the different decisions you'll need to make when developing a research methodology, whether that's for your thesis or any other research project. As you work from outside the onion like this towards inside, you'll face a range of choices that progress from a high level and philosophical to tactical and practical in nature. This also mim mimics the general structure for the methodology chapter. While Saunders' research onion is cer certainly not perfect, it's a useful tool for thinking holistically about methodology. At a minimum, it helps you understand what decisions you need to make in, in terms of your research design. So let's start with the very first layer of the onion, which is the research philosophy. But what does that mean? Well, the research philosophy is the foundation of any study as it describes the set of beliefs the research is built upon. Research philosophy can be described from either an ontological or epistemological point of view. We'll describe ontological and uh, epistemological in a little bit detail later. In simple terms, ontology is the what and how of what we know. In other words, what is the nature of reality and what are we really able to know and understand? For example, does reality exist as a single objective thing? Or is it different for each person? Think about the simulated reality in the film, The Matrix. That is ontology. Next, epistemology. It is about how we can obtain knowledge and come to understand things. Uh, how, how can we figure out what the reality is and what are the limits of this knowledge? This is a gross oversimplification, but it's a useful starting point. Let's look at the three of the main research philosophies that operate of, on different ontological and epistemological assumptions. Positivism, interpretivism, and pragmatism. These aren't the only research philosophies, but they are very common and provide a good starting point for understanding the spectrum of philosophies. So the first research philosophy, positivism. Uh, the positive Positivist research takes the view that knowledge exists outside of what's being studied. In other words, what is being studied can only be done so objectively, and it cannot include opinions or personal viewpoints. So the researcher doesn't interpret, they only observe. Positivism states that there is only one reality, and that all meaning is consistent between subjects. In positivist view, knowledge can only be acquired through empirical research, which is based on measurement and observation. In other words, all knowledge is viewed as uh, knowledge that is not reliant on human reasoning, but instead it is gained from research. So it can only be true, false, or meaningless. Basically, if something is not found to be true or false, it no longer holds any ground and is thus dismissed. Let's look at an example based on the question of whether aliens exist or not. Since positivism takes the stance that knowledge has to be empirically vigorous, the knowledge of whether aliens exist or not is irrelevant. This topic cannot be proven to be true or false, and thus this knowledge is seen as meaningless. Well, that's the one end of the spectrum. Let's look at the other end of the spectrum, which is interpretivism. So this philosophy emphasizes the influence that social and cultural factors can have on an individual. This view focuses on people's thoughts and ideas in light of the socio-cultural backdrop. 
So when the, with the interpretive philosophy, the researcher plays an active role in the study as it's necessary to draw a holistic of the participant and their actions, thoughts, and meanings. So let's take a look at another example. If you are studying psychology, you may make use of a case study in your research, which investigates an individual with a proposed diagnosis of schizophrenia. The interpretivist view would come into play here as social and cultural factors may influence the outcome of this diagnosis. So through your research, you may find that, uh, th that the in orig uh, individual originates from India, where schizophrenic symptoms like hallucinations are viewed positively, as they are thought to indicate that the person is uh, a medium of spirit. So this example illustrates that an interpretivist approach, since you as a researcher would make use of the patient's point of view, as well as your own interpretation when assessing the case study. Third research philosophy is pragmatism. Pragmatism highlights the importance of using the best tools possible to investigate a phenomena. The main aim of pragmatism is to approach research from a practical point of view, where knowledge is not fixed, but instead is constantly questioned and interpreted. For this reason, pragmatism consists of an element of researcher involvement and subjectivity specifically when drawing conclusions based on participants' response and decision. In other words, pragmatism is not committed to or limited by one research philosophy. Let's look at an example in the form of the trolley problem, which is a set of ethical and psychological thought experiments. And these participants have to decide on either killing one or person to save multiple people or allowing multiple people to die to avoid killing one person. This experiment can be altered, including details such as the one person or the group of the people being family members or loved ones. The fact that the experiment can be altered to suit uh, the researcher's uh, needs is an example of pragmatism. In other words, the outcome of the person doing the thought experiment is more important than the philosophical ideas behind the experiment. To recap, research philosophy is the foundation of any research project and reflects the ontological and epistemological assumptions of the researcher. So whenever you are designing your research methodology, the first thing you need to think about is which philosophy you will adopt given the nature of your research. So let's peel another layer and take a look at the research approach. Your research approach is, broad, is the broader method you will use for your research. It could be inductive or deductive. It's important to clearly identify your research approach as it will inform the decisions you take in terms of data collection and analysis in your study. Inductive approach uh, entail generating theories from research rather than starting, from, starting with the theory as a foundation. Whereas deductive approaches begin with a theory and they aim to build to test those. So an inductive approach could be used in the study of an otherwise unknown isolated community. There's very little knowledge about this community and therefore research would have to be conducted to gain information on the community, thus leading to the formation of theories. On the other hand, Deductive approach would be taken when investigating changes in the physical properties of animals over time, as this would like, likely be rooted in the theory of evolution. In other words, the starting point is a well-established pre-existing body of research. Closely linked to research approaches are qualitative and quantitative research. Simply put, qualitative research focuses on textual, visual, or audio-based audio data, while quantitative research focuses on numerical data. What's the relevance of qualitative and quantitative data to research approaches? Well, inductive approaches are usually used within qualitative researches, while qu quantitative research tends to reflect a deductive approach, usually informed by positive philosophy. 
The reason for using a deductive approach here is that quantitative research typically begins with a theory as a foundation, where a progress is made to you through hypothesis testing. In other words, a wider theory is applied to a particular context or an observation to see whether these fit it in within the theory. So to recap, the two research approaches, inductive and deductive, uh, to decide on the right approach for your study, you need to assess the type of research you aim to conduct. Ask yourself whether your research will be built upon something that exists or whether you'll be investigating something that cannot necessarily be rooted in previous research. So far, we have looked at pretty conceptual and intangible aspects of the onion. Now it's time to peel another layer off that onion and get a little more practical. So we are introducing this research strategy. This layer of the research onion details how, based on the aims of the study, research can be conducted. There are several approaches you can take. Uh, it includes survey research, experimental research, action research, case study research, grounded theory, ethnography, and archival research. There are many more uh, apart from these, but we are going to discuss these research strategies. Starting with survey research, this is one of the most effective methods of conducting a research. This is a systematic investigation uh, that can be conducted via a survey. So for instance, we want to uh, we want to see the response of consumers uh, for a newly introduced item on the menu. So what we can do is we can conduct a research survey. Uh, we can either ask people um, through an interview whether they like it or not or we can give them a form through which they can answer they can submit their responses that would be a survey uh, survey can be conducted through secondary or primary data secondary data is the data that is already established and we are just going to use it whereas primary data is the data that is specifically collected for the that research and it can be quantitative, we can use quantitative method, methods, or it can also be qualitative. The second strategy is experimental research. Experimental research involves manipulating one variable, the independent variable, to observe a change in another variable, the dependent variable. And we do so to assess the relationship between the variables. The purpose of experimental research is to support refute or validate a research hypothesis. This research strategy follows the principle of the scientific method and is conducted within a controlled environment or setting. So experimental research aims to test existing theories rather than create new ones. Experimental research aligns with the positivist approach as it assumes that knowledge can only be studied objectively and in isolation from external factors such as context or culture. Let's look, an look, let's look at an example of experimental research. If you had a hypothesis that a certain brand of food can raise a dog's protein level, you could make use of experimental research to compare the effects of the specific brand to a regular diet. In other words, you could test your hypothesis. In this example, you would have two group, groups, where one group consists of dogs with no changes to their diet, that is the control group, and the other group consists of dogs being fed the specific brand that you aim to investigate, that is called the experimental group. You would then test your hypothesis by comparing the protein levels in both the groups. Action research is another research strategy that can be used. The simplest way of describing action research is by saying that it involves learning through action. Action research is conducted in practical settings such as classroom, hospital, workspace, as opposed to a controlled environment. Action research helps to inform researchers of problems or weaknesses related to interactions within the real world. With action research, there is a strong focus on the participants, the people who are involved in the issue being studied. 
which is why it's sometimes referred to as participant action research or PAR. An example of action research is a classroom intervention. The researcher comes with an idea and it is implemented with the help of the classroom management, uh, the students, the teacher. So the findings are then discussed with the with all the stakeholders to see how the better how better the intervention was. The process is repeated until the intervention works just right for the classroom. In this way, a practical solution is given to a problem and it is generated by the combination of researcher and the participants feedback. This kind of research is generally applied in the social sciences, specifically in professions where individuals aim to improve on themselves and the work that they are doing. Action research is most commonly adopted in qualitative studies and is rarely seen in quantitative studies. This is because as you, can, as you can see in the above example, action research makes use of language and interactions rather than statistics and numbers. Case study research is a detailed in-depth study of a single subject, for example, a person, a group, or an institution. It could also be an event, phenomena, or an issue. In this type of research, the subject is analyzed to gain an in-depth understanding of issues in a real-life setting. The objective here is to gain an in-depth understanding within the context of the study and not necessarily to generalize the, the findings. It is vital that when conducting case study research, you take the social context and culture into account which means that this type of research is more often than not qualitative in nature and tends to be inductive. Also, since the researcher's assumptions and understanding play a role in case study research, it is typically informed by an interpretivist philosophy. For example, a study on political views of a specific group of people needs to, be, needs to take into account the current political situation within a country and the factors that could also contribute towards participants taking a certain view. Next up, grounded theory. Grounded theory is all about letting the data speak for itself. In other words, in grounded theory, you let the data inform the development of a new theory, model, or framework. Due to the name, the theory you develop is grounded in the data. Grounded theory is therefore very useful for research into issues that are completely new or under-researched. It is typically qualitative, although it can also use quantitative data, uh, and it takes an inductive approach. Typically, this form of research involves identifying commonalities between sets of data and results uh, and are then drawn from completed research without the aim of fitting the findings with a pre-existing theory or a framework. For example, if you were to study uh, the awareness of sexual harassment uh, in the dancers community, so you'd enter your research without any hypothesis or theories. You'd rather work from the knowledge that you gain from your study to develop theories, frameworks, and the knowledge. Ethnography involves observing people in their natural environments and drawing meanings from their cultural interactions. The objective with ethnography is to capture the subjective experiences of participants to see the world through their eyes. Ethnographers study the meaning of the behavior, the language, the interaction among the members of the culture sharing group. So for example, if you were interested in, uh, in, in studying interactions on a mental health discussion board, you could use ethnography to analyze interactions and draw an understanding of the participants' subjective experiences. Or if you wanted to explore the behavior, language, and beliefs of an isolated Amazonian tribe, 
ethnography could allow you to develop a complex, complete description of the social behaviors of the group by immersing yourself into the community rather than just observing from the outside. Given the nature of ethnography, it generally reflects an interpretivist research philosophy and involves an inductive, qualitative research approach. However, there are exceptions to this. For example, quantitative ethnography is also proposed by some researchers such as David Schaffer. Last but not the least is archival research. An archival research strategy draws from materials that already exist and meaning is then established through a review of the existing data. This method is particularly well suited to historical research and can make use of materials such as records and manuscripts. For example, if you were interested in people's beliefs about so-called supernatural phenomena in the medi medieval period, you could consult manuscripts and records from the time and use those as your core data set. So as you can see, there's a wide range of choices in terms of research strategy. The right choice for your project will depend largely on your research aims and objectives, as well as the choices you make in terms of research philosophy and approach. The next layer of the research onion is simply called choices. They could have been a little more specific. The next layer of the research onion is simply called choices. In any case, this layer is simply about deciding how many types of data, qualitative or quantitative, you will use in your research. There are three options, mono, mixed and multi-method. Let's take a look at them. Choosing to use a mono method means that you will only make use of one type of data, either qualitative or quantitative. For example, if you were to conduct a study investigating uh, a community's opinion on a specific pizza restaurant, you could make use of a qualitative approach only so that you can analyze participants' view and opinions of the restaurant. If you were to make use of both quantitative and qualitative data, you'd be taking a mixed method approach. Keeping with the previous example, you may also want to assess how many people in a community eat specific types of pizza. For this, you could make use of a survey to collect quantitative data and then analyze the results statistically, producing quantitative results in addition to the qualitative ones. Lastly, there's multi-method. With a multi-method approach, you would make use of a wider range of approaches with more than just a one quantitative and one qualitative approach. For example, if you conduct a study looking at archives from a specific culture, you could make use of two qualitative methods such as thematic and content analysis, and then additionally make use of quantitative methods to analyze numerical data. As with all layers of research onion, the right choice here depends on the nature of your research as well as your research aims and objectives. There's also the practical consideration of viability. In other words, what kind of data will you be able to access given your research constraints? Moving on to the fifth layer, time horizon. This one's pretty straightforward. The time horizon simply describes how many points in time you plan to collect your data at. There are two options. It could be cross-sectional and longitudinal. Imagine that you're wasting time on social media and think, oh, oh I want to study the language of memes and how this language evolves over time. For this study, you'd need to collect data over multiple times 
perhaps over a few weeks, months, or even years. Therefore, you would make use of a longitudinal time horizon. This option is highly beneficial when studying changes and progressions over time. If instead you want to study the language used in memes at a certain point in time, for example, in 2020, you would make use of a cross-sectional time horizon. This is where data is collected at one point in time. So you wouldn't be gathering data to see how language changes, but rather what language exists at a snapshot in time. The type of data collected could be qualitative, quantitative, or a mix of both, as the focus is on the time of collection, not the data time. As with all other choices, the nature of your research and your research aims and objectives are the key determining factors when deciding on the time horizon. You'll also need to consider practical constraints such as the amount of time you have available to complete your research, especially if you are doing your research thesis. So finally, we reach the center of the onion, which is the sixth layer. This is where you get down to the real practicalities of your research to make choices regarding specific techniques and procedures. So you have to decide on what data you will collect and what data collection methods you will use. For example, will you use survey or perhaps one-on-one -on -one interviews? You will have to decide on how you will go about sampling the population. For example, random sampling, convenient sampling, snowball sampling. You have to determine the type of data analysis you will use to answer your research questions, such as content analysis or a statistical analysis like correlation. You have to set up materials you will be using for your study, such as writing up questions for a survey or interviews. What's important to note here is that these techniques and procedures need to align with all other layers of the research onion. That is the research philosophy, research approaches, research strategy, choices, and time horizon. For example, if you are adopting a deductive quantitative research approach, it's unlikely that you will use interviews to collect your data, as you will want high volume numerical data for which surveys are better suited. So you need to ensure that the decisions at each layer of your onion align with the rest and most importantly that they align with your research aims and objectives. So the, let's do a recap. The research onion details the many interrelated choices you will need to make when you are crafting your research methodology. You start with the research philosophy, the set of beliefs your research is based on, positivism, interpretivism, pragmatism. Then comes research approaches, the broader, broader method that you will use could be inductive, deductive, then research strategies. How will you conduct these researches? It could be survey, experimental, action, case study, ethnography. Choices, how many methods you will use, mono method, mixed method, or multi-method. Time horizon, the number of points in time at which you will collect your data, cross-sectional or longitudinal. Techniques and procedures, data collection methods, data analysis techniques, sampling strategies, etc. Now that you, we have peeled the onion, it's time for you to get cooking. Most importantly, remember that designing your research methodology all starts with your research aims and objectives. So make sure those are crystal clear before you start peeling. 